probably there wouldn't be a person in this room that didn't hear Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, warn that the era of global warming has ended and the era of global boiling has arrived last week. And he said, although climate change is evident, we can still stop the worst. But to do so, we must turn a year of burning heat into a year of burning ambition. And that's my intention as well. So what did the era of global warming look like over the past 50 years in respect of disasters? Well, the World Meteorological Organization recently released, re-released a report of theirs and basically they identified that there were in that 50 years, almost 12,000 disasters globally attributed solely to extreme weather, climate or water hazards. That over that time period, the number of these disasters increased by a factor of five. There were 2 million deaths caused by these disasters and over 91% of these deaths were in developing countries. There were um, $4.3 trillion US dollars in economic losses, and a disaster occurred more or less every day, killing around 115 people a day and causing um, about over $200 million of losses daily. So that was the kind of warming up era. What's it going to be like in the glo uh, global boiling era? So let's just have a look at the first month of the global boiling era. So July to now, the first thing we had was the Cerberus heat wave in Europe. And most of you hopefully are familiar with the three headed monster from um, uh, Greek mythology, also from Dante's Inferno, which is quite the right place for it to be. Um, and the Italian health ministry at the, um, put 16 cities under red alert heat warnings for days as temperatures stayed in the forties. And after first aid work workers were drafted in to treat visitors suffering the effects of 48 degree temperatures in Greece's most visited monument, the Acropolis was closed to protect tourists in the unprecedented heat wave in Athens. Wildfires forced the evacuation of hundreds of residents and tourists on the Greek islands of Rhodes, Evia and Corfu since 17th of July, and I'm sure we've all seen them on television. The emissions of these wildfires have reached record levels with an estimated total of one megaton of carbon emissions only between 1 July and 25 July, almost doubling the July 2007 record following several days of high intensity fires. Very familiar sounding from our fires in the 2019-20 season. There were deadly floods in India and Pakistan, as Pakistan is still struggling to recover from last summer's flooding that killed 1,739 people and caused $30 billion in damage. And after a delayed start to this year's monsoon that brought yet another deadly early summer to an end, South Asia was once again hit by record-breaking monsoon rains that wrought devastation in both North India and Pakistan. And I'm keeping on going because it's been pretty dire this first month of um, global boiling. Um, there was floods and record heat in the US, which saw weather extremes across the country from brutal heat in the southern and southwest US to torrential downpours and flooding in the northeast. And I did forget to say that the WMO declared July 2023 to be the hottest month globally on record. Um, there was extreme heat and drought in Uruguay, which has led to its worst water crisis ever recorded, following three years of extremely low rainfall that reduced fresh water reserves to historic lows. Record wildfires in Canada. As of August the 1st, 5,082 fires burned over 13 million hectares, about 4% of the entire forest area of Canada, and more than seven times the long-term average. And we would have seen on TV that wildfire smoke spread from Canada to the US, blanketing many iconic cities in a toxic orange haze. There was extreme heat as well in the Middle East and North Africa. Temperatures in Morocco's top tourist city, Marrakesh, hit 46.8 degrees, and Egypt experienced its longest period of continuous heat waves on record. And there were floods in South Korea and Japan, where in South Korea, 
432 millimeters of rain poured down in, in Sal in 24 hours, roughly the same amount that falls in one whole typical summer month. And in one district, 137 millimeters fell in a single hour, breaking a record. In Japan, heavy rain triggered devastating landslides and the Japanese authorities ordered tens of thousands of residents to leave their homes. And floods and record heat in China are the most recent disasters and Beijing saw an entire month's worth of rainfall fall over 48 hours, which triggered landslides, destructive floods from the remnants of Typhoon Doksuri. And on 16th of July, a weather station in northern China, or northwestern China, recorded China's highest temperature ever, a scary 52.2 degrees centigrade. So here we are in the era of global boiling. And we can see that the frequency of these extreme events is increasing worldwide. And sadly, even if we stopped carbon emissions today, they would continue to increase because of the locked carbon that we have in our atmosphere and our oceans. And so as much as I am of a fan of trying to reduce our carbon emissions and very strong fan of negative emissions to try and get rid of some of that locked in carbon, um, we have a problem on our hands. And our new abnormal, rather than our new normal, is increasingly frequent, severe, extreme events, extreme heat, heavy rainfall, drought, fire weather, ocean and sea level rise. And not only are these very harmful to people and our infrastructure, they are becoming more costly. And so you can see um, this data here from the Centre for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, that in 2022, um, the annual average economic losses were 223.8 billion US dollars, compared to the average annual losses um, in the previous 20 years of 187 um, billion US dollars. And you can see, um, I haven't got a pointer, but you can see if you look where Australia is, that's Oceania. And you can see there that um, you can see reflected there some of the damage that was done um, here by the floods in 2022. To my mind, we are preparing to win a war on climate change fueled disasters. These catastrophic disasters are here to stay for as far as the future as I can see, and they're getting worse and we're not planning for them properly. We are seeing in Australia that the solutions of the past are no longer working as disasters intensify and become more frequent. Incremental approaches are not keeping up with the spiraling increase in disasters caused by climate change. And our efforts are going to saving lives through warning people about the disaster so that they can get out of the way. Even where this is successful, once the disaster subsides, we're having a dreadful time trying to recover from major damage and loss. This keeps on happening. This is not sustainable. We need to seek new approaches. ANU has embarked upon a series of research initiatives to develop transformational solutions for stopping disasters and reducing their risks. If you remember back to those 2019, 20 bushfires, um, there were a lot of very large bushfires that started in very remote areas and they spread pretty quickly to places where they could actually cause damage. And generally um, fire research, for those of you that are familiar with it, has been dedicated to understanding how large fires get larger and how we can stop them from damaging important infrastructure. The thing is that large fires start small in remote areas. And we usually don't see them until they have grown too big to extinguish. So at ANU, what we're doing is investing our efforts into looking at a whole lot of different technologies that we might not have used before, but might really help us with trying to find these fires early and put them out when they're tiny. And that's because when the bushfire ignites, every second counts before it gets too big to extinguish. So we really want to try and put it out when it's tiny so we don't get those catastrophic bushfires that we had before. And so for those of you that have not seen this, um, it was this demo, um, the idea is a fire would start in remote bushland. We'd have a whole lot of different technologies to detect it while it was small. And then before it could spread, we would have a new technology or new technologies that put it out within five minutes. 
Um, and so we're very lucky at ANU that we have support from Optus for the ANU Optus Research Centre of Excellence for bushfires, um, which is focusing very much on a whole lot of different technologies to detect those fires within as close to one minute as possible. But what we don't have, we have had some research done on how we can extinguish them within five minutes. That research has stopped for a little while. So we've got these wonderful students who've been working for this whole year on trying to develop new approaches to extinguishing fires within five minutes in remote bushland. And they found out that it's not as easy as it sounds. Thank you, Alex. Imagine a land ablaze where flames rage with the wind and smoke engulfs the horizon. This was the Black Summer, a, de a devastating chapter etched into the heart of Australia's history. In 2019, bushfires ravaged the continent, leaving behind a trail of devastation and a wake up call for the world. These bushfires consumed 17 million hectares of land, which is, which is bigger than Bangladesh and more than twice the size of Austria, caused $20 billion of damage, uh, doubled Australia's CO2 emissions and took the lives of 33 people. These fires grow rapidly, often spiraling out of control, but what if we could prevent them from reaching that point? Surprisingly, in Australia, up to 90% of the area burned is due to ignitions by the natural force of lightning. Now, these fires aren't very big. We plan to suppress the fire before it goes out of control. The ANU and Optus Bushfire Research Centre of Excellence is evaluating a series of technologies to detect ignitions when they're small. Using this technology and building upon Jack and Bruce's water glider project, our honours team uh, comprised of myself, Suleiman Azizi, Damon Howworth, Martin Barrick, Mickey Morimoto, and Joshua Brooker-Williams are developing a novel technology to suppress fires within the first five minutes after detection. And with this, I introduce to you the ballistic guided water bomb our bushfire honours research team is, to, uh, is developing. This innovative concept involves a bomb that targets and guides itself towards the intended bushfire, ultimately utilising a spinning shell and water sprinkling method to evenly distribute the payload through centripetal force. Once released, a parachute recovery system ensures the bomb's reusability. We envision that the final size of the bomb will be quite large, holding, a five, holding 500 litres of water. Um, our runners team this year is working on a four litre prototype for this project. Um, and our team has a particular focus on the guidance and targeting subsystem using an infrared camera and GPS, while also focusing on assessing the most suitable materials for the liquid. Over the past months, with the mentorship of Rosalind Princely and Ian Cummings, um, and the technical assistance by Rob Marty and Andrew Tridgell, we've been simulating the accuracy of the bomb uh, when dropped using Arju Pilot and MATLAB. This has been taking a lot of time to perfect uh, as we aim to deliver a product with an accuracy of within two meters. Currently, we are fine tuning the settings, nearing the final stage of simulation before commencing prototype construction. And in the materials analysis, our team has been conducting a finite element analysis on different materials for the outer and inner structure of the bomb, obtaining a variety of data on each material, such as the Young's modulus and failure strength, then putting it into ANSYS to evaluate how it will deform given the air pressure during its path to the bushfire from the plane. Based on this analysis, we've narrowed down our material selection to carbon fiber and fiberglass, but leaning more towards fiberglass. And throughout all of this, we've been receiving ongoing support from Seth, Charlie and Brody from the RAAF, uh, Jack from Geodrones Australia, Natalie from Raytheon, ACT Parks and the RFS. And through meticulous uh, material analysis and simulation refinement, our team is inching closer to building a prototype that could revolutionise fire suppression efforts and safeguard communities from the devastating consequences of bushfires. Thank you very much. Hopefully you all understand now the uh, big challenge that we have on our hands and what a difference it would make if we could put these fires out when they were small and the um, actual reality that we have students here that are trying to safeguard their future through doing so. So it's one thing to stop a bushfire and that's hard enough. It's possibly even harder to stop a cyclone um, and we um, know that um, the annual global damage from cyclones is over $28 billion. 
and that's on average. I think Cyclone Ian last year was $120 billion on its, its own. The mortality rate is 15,700 lives per year on average. Tropical cyclones are increasing in intensity due to climate change. And economic losses due to climate change um, and vulnerability of certain communities have increased sevenfold since 1980. And so ANU has been working with international experts to better understand how cyclones form and how we can intervene and stop them or reduce their intensity. So I'm really pleased to introduce you to you today, Jack Miller. Jack has been working with us for a year and a half. Yeah, to look at the feasibility and governance of cyclone interventions. Um, I forgot to tell you about Alex, but I'm gonna tell you about Jack. Jack is an undergraduate PhD physics student and Tuckwell scholar at the ANU with an interest in artificial intelligence and its application to scientific problems. And he's been doing research on cyclones with us, as I said, for a year and a half. And particularly what we um, asked Jack to do and what he did an amazing job of doing is he did a technical review of interventions that have been tried to modify cyclone intensity, destination or formation. Um, he, with his colleague, Aaron Tang, looked at ecological side effects, potential governance requirements. And we've jointly, um, as with Jack as the lead author, published um, a an, an article in a journal called um, Climate Risk Management, which I think has been published as we speak. So thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and I know sort of when you first hear about this, it sounds like a pretty wacky concept, right? It sounds like something out of the 60s, you know, nuclear age. Could we actually stop a cyclone? Um, and that was my first thought uh, when I got a phone call from Roslyn back in first year, uh, wondering like, well, whether we could do this or not. Um, but then sort of as I uh, came in and started looking more at the research, uh, it surprised me as to how feasible it might actually be. And so there have been, you know, several efforts uh, on this in the past. Uh, one was actually from the 60s, uh, of course, by the US government uh, called Project Storm, Storm Fury. And in that project, um, they tried to use traditional cloud seeding um, to basically create ice within a cyclone and that ice uh, would change sort of the heat flow in the system uh, and result in the formation of uh, sort of a secondary um, eye wall within the cyclone. So it would expand sort of the, um, the, the center of the cyclone and thus decrease the intensity. Um, so that, that was one hypothesis that was um, presented in the 1960s. Unfortunately, there were some issues with that. Um, and since then, people have moved on to other approaches. Um, so one has been high altitude particle injection, which could be used uh, to change again the heat flow within the cyclone. Um, unfortunately, this has quite a high logistical burden um, and may have significant side effects. But nonetheless, the modeling shows that it could indeed be, uh, be feasible. Uh, something else that's been tried in recent years has been uh, an effort from this company called Ocean Therm. And so their idea has been, okay, cyclones require a certain temperature in the ocean to form. What if we could simply cool down the ocean surface and stop the formation or decrease the intensity of the cyclone? Uh, unfortunately, some modeling recently has uh, disproved this idea. Um, and it, even, even in their sort of uh, optimistic concepts, uh, it would cost about $2 billion, I think, a year to run one of these things, which is, uh, is pretty intense. But um, we've sort of finally come down upon in, a, in our research article, aerosol injection, as perhaps the most feasible option. Um, and so I think in a paper by uh, Rosenfeld, who's one of the, the, the leads in, uh, in aerosol theory and a big name in the field, uh, proposed something like a, um, a plane, a single plane with uh, the appropriate aerosol might be able to decrease the intensity of a cyclone by something like 30%. And the reason why that's particularly important is because uh, the cyclone damage is a, is a fat tailed distribution. So if you can make a small difference in the intensity, the damage uh, caused can decrease quite rapidly. And so that's a, a point we make in the paper. And so surprisingly, there is actually some hope uh, in the feasibility of stopping these cyclones, but there are also questions to be had about whether we should necessarily do so. And um, you know, the, the argument is very clear for why we should. You know, cyclones cause um, an extreme amount of damage. When, when I was a kid, in fact, growing up in Cairns, uh, I lived through Cyclone Yazi, and, and that did, did horrible damage to, um, uh, to, to the coastline near me that was 
uh, still hasn't been fixed to this day. Um, but there are sort of concerns to be had. The first is that there's no clear governance structure um, to, to take care of whether we should or shouldn't um, intervene in a cyclone. There's no clear international body. Um, and, and cyclones are really international affairs. It goes through a lot of different borders. And one can imagine situations in which, say, the US, for example, intervenes in a cyclone um, and results in its redirection to some other country. Uh, and just the, the who, who has liability in that uh, case, for example. There's also questions about social license. Um, and yeah, so in, in the conclusion of our study, we sort of came to the conclusion that, um, yes, it, it is quite feasible to, to possibly stop these cyclones or decrease their intensity. Um, but a lot more research is needed to decide upon, firstly, their feasibility, and secondly, uh, whether or not we can um, navigate the governance landscape and the societal consequences of possibly doing so. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. Uh, a bit of a wacky concept, but it could work. Thank you. So thanks very much, Jack. And um, we now have um, quite a different um, type of presentation. Um, and I really wish we could stop all disasters. But the fact is that we actually can't. And so in some situations, um, we need to actually um, work out how to avoid the disaster in the first place. And you can see from this graph, which is um, from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre, that in 2021, 38 million people um, had to move out of the way of some kind of hazard. And of those, 23.7 million people had to move out of the way of some kind of natural disaster. And of those natural disasters, 22.3 million people had to move out of the way because of some kind of um, non-geological or weather climate related natural disaster. And so um, that was pretty bad because um, all those people suffered from those disasters before they moved. And so what we'd like to see is a situation where in Australia, we would have people relocate before the disaster so that they wouldn't suffer the um, damage and the loss that they have suffered in the past. And so um, ICEDS has been working in a collaborative group led by Naomi Hay from the ANU School of Art and Design, um, from Tony at the Studio of the Edge of the World, with the University of Canberra and Matha Architects, to develop a discussion paper, website and future exhibition to open a national discussion on the urgent need for Australia to develop a national relocation strategy for communities at risk from extreme climate events. Um, I'm shortly going to introduce you to Owen, who's one of our students who's been working on this project. And Owen will talk about the cost benefit framework, which he has developed and used to determine the costs and benefits of different options for relocation of housing, as well as his research on case studies of relocation attempts from around the world. And Owen will be followed by Emmy, Emmy will present a website that Molly, who you'll also meet, has been developing, as well as a very innovative mapping approach that she's starting to develop to better represent how hazards and risks change over time to deal with the limitations of the current much more static mapping of the impact of climate change. So um, I'll first introduce Owen, who's an undergraduate PhD student. Come up here, Owen and Emmy um, and Molly, um, undergraduate PhD student at the Australian National University. Um, and um, Emmy recently completed her astrophysics and design double degree, which is a great combination for this kind of work. And she's now studying a master's of computing at ANU and is a research student with ICED. So thank you very much. Um, Owen, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the lectern, thank you. Thanks for having me. My name's Owen. Trapped in a vicious cycle of rebuilding and continued risk exposure, current Australian and global responses to growing climate volatility are not sustainable and will not be a viable future option. As climate change exacerbates our vulnerability to natural disasters, governments and policymakers may be compelled to respond to the imminent peril in a highly disruptive manner through planned relocation. Planned relocation is a broad term encompassing several methods, including compulsory and voluntary buybacks, as well as compulsory and voluntary land swaps. The first question that must be answered is, what is more economically feasible? To stay put and be subjected to years of potential flood damage or to move out of the floodplain 
with the immediate and long-term risk, uh, the long-term aim of reducing risk. Secondly, if relocation is shown to be more cost-effective, what is more efficient, land swaps or buybacks? This was the focus of my research. I developed a cost-benefit framework to investigate the factors facilitating household and government decision-making and use this to determine the costs, benefits, feasibility, and effectiveness of different relocation options. The costs of relocating were compared to the cost of staying put under a range of flooding scenarios in Lismore. Under the set assumptions, it was shown that the flood, rebuilding and recovery costs over a 20 year period greatly exceeded the cost of staying put, uh, greatly, exceeded, sorry, greatly exceeded the expected cost to undertake plan relocation, meaning it was cheaper to move off the floodplain. In comparing buybacks with land swaps as means of relocation, land swaps were shown to generate the highest avoided costs, making them the most efficient outcome. This cost benefit framework has now been developed into an app by Charlie O'Neill, another ANU student, which could be a helpful decision-making tool for other governments and councils in areas prone to flooding. These findings clearly demonstrate how plan relocation can be more cost-effective than remaining and rebuilding. Once relocation is identified as a cost-effective solution for policymakers, the complexities of managing retreat must now be addressed. This led onto the next stage of my research to investigate international and domestic cases of relocation attempts. In my research, I was surprised to find that relocation has occurred across all inhabited continents, with there being over 400 cases to choose from. One of the central international case studies that I analyzed involved the Carteret Islands in PNG. Since 1994, half of the surface of the Carteret Islands has been engulfed by rising sea levels resulting from climate change. This is representative of the dire situation in the Pacific, whereby 0.6 million people are expected to face climate-induced resettlement by 2050. The case of the Carteret Islanders highlights the resilience and persistence of a community-driven relocation response. Drawing lessons from this community could make major inroads into future Australian relocation policies, as it provides options that are not entirely reliant on government action. I identified the need for overarching national guidelines for relocation, whereby the fundamental aspects that must be acknowledged are summarized here. As such, the study concluded that the primary focus for policymakers needs to be risk reduction on a social and material level, which can be maximized by ensuring meaningful, extensive community engagement, acquiring funding, and maximizing community participation rates. With climate change already at the doorstep of the Pacific, it is imperative for us to take definitive action now rather than later. Thank you. Following on from Owen's discussion, this information and research needs to be communicated and made accessible through a website and potentially an exhibition. This is the prototype for the landing page of the website, developed by fellow student Molly Dixon. Owen's research showed us the surprising number of places that have been relocated in some way. The landing page of the website is a space where we can visually represent the quantity of these relocations in an interesting and interactive way, with each dot representing a different case study. This is an important visual representation to develop, given many Australians don't realise that relocations are not unusual or a new concept. By representing the information in this way, the website can be developed as an accessible method to communicate to a wide audience, educating and engaging each viewer. Many current maps and visualisations of climate change related risks are static and oversimplify situations and relationships. I've been working on a prototype for data visualization that develops a new way of representing how climate change related situations and risks change over time, as well as allowing for modeling and planning for the future. We were faced with a challenging task that required diverging from traditional ways of mapping to a dynamic representation that communicates the fact that situations and risks are not isolated. Multiple risks or situations may be developing at one time. 
They affect one another and they are constantly changing and progressing. The prototype that I'm showing is not a complete mapping, rather a scrolling page that steps the audience through uh, multiple ways of visually communicating potential data and characteristics of the data. We have been developing a framework of methods and concepts for the later development of a complete mapping. Each animation on the right deals with representing one of these concepts. I will also note that these animations have the potential to be visualized over a geographical map, but at this stage, they are not. This animation here explores the changing situational relationships over time. Each circle represents a different situation with the lines indicating whether they are affecting one another. The animations are being developed to have the potential for data input, allowing for the communication of data in a visually interesting and engaging way. On the left is another animation exploring the communication of a hypothetical situation through a less abstract, abstract approach alongside the core visualization helping the viewer relate to the data. For example, the core visualization could show the interacting effects of contributors, such as an increase in average open temperature, ocean temperature being one circle, and an increase of melting ice sheets being another. Then on the left, we see the result of these interacting contributors. This next animation shows how a hypothetical bushfire case study could be re represented in this way. As the average rainfall increases, the white circle, we see that the fuel load also begins to increase, the orange circle. In this time, poor land management practices may have been occurring, the pink circle, which in turn also increases fuel load. We then see this flash of white that represents some kind of change in speed or acceleration of the situation. In this case, the rainfall stops increasing and we see the sudden growth in a lack of fuel moisture, the yellow circle. For this example, the overall situation is very simplified, but it gives an idea of how one of these visualization communicates a real life scenario. This could be done with any scenario and will be developed to show the interdependence of social, economic, environmental situations and more. Some of the later animations also begin to explore our definition of risk and what we consider to be a risk event. I am now looking at developing these further to begin to explore visualizations of a situation or risk developing, a moment or period of intervention, and then the knock-on effect of this intervention has on the situation. This will aim to communicate that if our maps allow us to model and visualize potential future situations and risks, we can then develop strategies and interventions that can change the progression of these risks and the way that they affect people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emmy. And you can see that this is a wonderful example of how we can combine design thinking with science. So we've heard some examples about how we can protect Australia from disasters, about some novel solutions. And um, I don't know if there's anyone here from NEMA, but we do have the Disaster Ready Fund and we are spending $1 billion over five years on preparing for disasters and they're funding all sorts of communities to do many different kinds of interventions such as levy banks and nature-based solutions and those kinds of interventions. But it does pale a little into significance with the $368 billion where we're thinking right out to the 2050s about how we're going to defend ourselves um, from who knows who into the future. And so what I want to know is where is the comparable investment from government in the new technologies that can protect our country from natural hazards? And is this really the correct balance of expenditure of public money to assure the safety and security of Australia? Similar to the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, which is developing advanced technologies needed for Australia's national security by defence. It's my belief that we need a similar fund to deliver advanced technologies and strategies to protect Australia from disasters. Defence through this fund is calling upon the best innovators from across the country to work in partnership with industry and academia to rapidly deliver highly targeted disruptive technologies. We need an analogous fund 
for the disasters sector. We cannot succeed alone here at ANU as much as we'd like to think we could. This is an issue of national and global security. Massive investment is needed by both public and private sectors to develop these new technologies and approaches to defending our country from climate fueled natural disasters. Thank you. Um, so um, what's the time? So we've got probably time for one question and I'm gonna see if I can use this magic machine that's supposed to tell me about the questions from the online, but um, I don't know how to work it. <laughs> um, so, um, but what we'll do is we'll take a line, a question um, now and from, oops, online. Oh, we'll take one from on the floor while we're waiting for one from online. Yes. Hi, it's John Blackson yeah. um, from uh, Bell School in CAP. I, I'm really interested in Jack's idea about, I just want to, we can explain the aerosol bit. How does that work? It sounds really interesting. Stand up, Jack. And the other thing about aerosols as well is Lynn might be here as well. Oh, is Lynn here? Is Lynn, Lynn, no? Oh, sorry. We do have um, a research fellow work taking, taking the um, mantle from Jack and she's actually um, working now with um, Danny Rosenfeld, who was the professor that Jack mentioned, um, and another professor from the US to actually model um, how you would use aerosols um, to stop cyclones. And we'd be more than happy, John, for you to come and talk to us tomorrow, if you'd like, um, to find out more about it. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. yeah, it is pretty exciting. Um, and it's the way of the future, it has to be. Um, there is a question here from um, online. Um, and it's to Alex and to me. Alex, if you would like to come up here or stand up. Is your forest fighting project doing any work with industry and the, oh, maybe Marta can answer this question, and the AI monitoring that's being implemented in the Green Triangle? So we have Marta Yebra here, who's the director of the um, ANU Optus Bushfire Research Centre of Excellence, which is doing all the work on detection. And I think she would be really well placed to answer that question if people don't mind getting an answer from the audience. Oh, um, is the, oh, sure. It's just about, um, are you do, doing any work with industry and the AI monitoring that's being implemented in the green triangle? So because it's on, it's more on detection than we talked about extinguishing. So Yes, I will be talking a lot about that uh, later in my talk, but definitely we have uh, connections with many companies uh, in Australia and overseas to implement artificial intelligence for uh, automatic uh, early fire detection. Yeah. Thanks very much, Marta. And, and you will hear a lot more from Marta after the break. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, invite you all to have something yummy to eat outside, which you probably need after all of that um, ex exciting new information we've gave, given you. Um, and um, But if you do have any questions and you're online and we haven't answered your questions yet, there is an email address here and you can email us and we'll forward it on to the right person and you'll get an answer, we promise. Um, so um, I really do promise that you'll get an answer. And if you are in the room and you have a question, except for Jack, who seems to have had to have left, um, the other students will be here um, sitting in the foyer and you can come and talk to them and ask them any questions you like, or you can talk to me as well. So thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you after the break. Bye-bye. <laughs>